Good morning, everybody. Well, before we get to more serious things, let me tell you how the Internet of Things almost wrecked my marriage after 40 years. So it was uh, 10 years ago, and uh, being the chairman uh, and the chief executive of a, of a telecommunications group, uh, and uh, having started up some software companies before that, uh, I thought it was a good idea to be the first to experience all the benefits of the connected living. And uh, I wired up all my house and uh, connected everything and used my phone as an access uh, gateway. And uh, all of a sudden things started not working any longer. And uh, my wife at some point uh, told me that uh, if we were not going back to the old way of doing things, uh, she would have asked for divorce. <laughs> but uh, uh, after 10 years, things have changed quite a lot. First of all, we've seen a, an immense increase in computing power. Now, everyone knows the Moore's law, but uh, nobody thinks that there is a big difference between doubling 1,000 transistors and doubling one billion transistors. So uh, what the Moore's law has created after 40 years of operation is an immense success of computing capacity. But not only the Moore's law has been at work, also uh, energy consumption per unit uh, of computation has decreased quite dramatically. In the last 10 years, the unit uh, of energy consumed per unit of computation has decreased by 100 times. And uh, finally, also the bandwidth available has increased dramatically. Uh, because normally the bandwidth available increases or should increase technically uh, three times as fast as the computing power. So when we have a, a law in telecommunications that is uh, even more aggressive in terms of availability of bandwidth than, than the Moore law. But uh, of course, that it depends on, on the investments that are made and uh, uh, not purely on the technical side. Because on the technical side, we would have plenty of uh, uh, transportation of connection capacity available. Um, so what all this has created uh, has been uh, the smartphone revolution. You know that uh, one every two people in the world is, has a mobile phone, one every five people in the world has a smartphone. So the smartphone revolution is becoming really universal. And this in turn has created another revolution. The smartphone revolution has allowed us to collect an immense amount of data on the life of each of us. Uh, Thanks or not thanks, it depends on the point of view, uh, to the smartphones. We know, everyone knows where we are, what we do, whom we deal with, uh, what our preferences are. So it's, uh, it's a very detailed knowledge of the preferences of each individual consumer. And uh, of course, this is one part of the uh, of, the, of the coin. The other part is that uh, we have been developing analytical tools uh, with the big data uh, developments that allow us to utilize all this data and to make a coherent vision of what they mean. Of course, there, there are still lots of things to do on the big data. I mean, there is a lot of hype and a lot of talk about big data, but I think that we are in a very early stage. Uh, we are promising perhaps more than uh, we are giving with the uh, big data analytics. But still, we will come up with, uh, with uh, uh, new sources of analytical tool that will make even more sense uh, uh, of uh, 
the data that we are collecting. So uh, the, I think that these changes uh, have allowed, in turn, an yet another revolution, because uh, thanks to the smartphone revolution, we have uh, made available to the, to the rest of the industry an enormous amount of very sophisticated uh, sensors uh, that can be used uh, for a number of other things. Uh, can you imagine that uh, w the computing power and the, and the kind of uh, infrastructure that is built into an iPad now is the same amount of computing power and it's even more sophisticated uh, than the computing power and the resources that have been used to send a man on the moon almost uh, now, almost 50 years ago, 40 and so years ago. So uh, this is something that nobody really gives much, pays much attention to, but uh, you have concentrated in a very thin and very light object an immense amount of sophisticated technology that is available at a very low price. So uh, if, you, if you make a taxonomy of, the, of these objects, you see that there are at least 11 big families of sensors that have been made available. And when I talk about the family, I talk about the group of sensors that are very differentiated within the family. So you are, I mean, y y you know them perhaps better than I do, measuring devices, proximity motion sensors, pressure devices, magnetic, uh, uh, image uh, sensors, uh, radiation sensors. I mean, all kinds of sensors that you can imagine are packed into a very small and sophisticated package. So that means that every object can be uh, equipped with not only with uh, computing power, but also with uh, sophisticated sensoring capacity. But again, this is not yet the end of the story because from the internet, from the Moore's law, from the, uh, from the uh, smartphone revolution to the Internet of Things. Now, uh, having all those intelligent connected things uh, uh, will be equipped with actuators, will be equipped me with mechanical parts, and we are going towards a world that will be dominated by intelligent robots. The robots that will be able to interpret the world around the, them and, we able and will be able to perform a lot of tasks that now are performed by the man. Uh, these connected robots we've seen already in the in in operations. I mean, think about, uh, of course, the Google Car. Of Google Car is a very sophisticated robot, and it's not yet ready. It will face an enormous amount of hurdles because of regulation, and so we will probably see the self-driving cars. Uh, as, as a normal commercially available product uh, in several years. But uh, where there is no problem of regulation, I mean, for instance, in agriculture, we see already connected robots uh, uh, that are already operating in the field. Robots that uh, perform a lot of tasks and that are extremely sophisticated and make uh, the life of uh, the agricultural operators much more, uh, much more sophisticated, much more productive, and much more effective. So the connected robot revolution is already there, and the self-driving driving vehicles are already in operations in, in the agricultural sector. And there are several areas where connected robots will develop uh, in a very short time logistics, security, home automation, medical care. Uh, but this is, I mean, I think for the time being the end of the story. I, I don't have uh, any, any, any longer, any futuristic uh, uh, development to predict. But uh, what I think is that this will transform radically all the business models that have been developed since the Industrial Revolution. Now, I've been, in my life, I had the opportunity to work uh, several times with startups. Uh, uh, I myself uh, 
uh, started up uh, a few companies. But one thing that I noted is that uh, many times a startup -er is giving an answer to a question that nobody has asked. So uh, it can be successful because, I mean, pr possibly uh, sometimes the question has not been asked because uh, it was so sophisticated that you could not even imagine that you could ask that question. But uh, I think most of the times uh, uh, you have to figure out why you have developed a certain uh, a certain uh, uh, device or a certain solution or a certain service. Now, I think that, uh, and I like very much the definition that I've seen recently on a paper. I think that what all this technology is doing, it's uh, empowering uh, the emergence of uh, the emergence of what has been called the outcome economy. So competition will not be any longer on differentiating goods and services, but delivering measurable results that are relevant to consumers. So the first problem that you will have is trying to understand, before you get right to write code, try to understand what the consumer wants. And uh, I think that, uh, uh, of course, in the past we've already seen a revolution of this kind, but I, I think that the, the kind of revolution, the, the amount of uh, transformational impact that this revolution has, is similar to the one that we've seen with uh, Sloan back 100 years ago, when uh, you remember there was only the T-Model and Ford uh, decided uh, that you could have any car as long as it was a black T-Model. And then Sloan came and said, uh, no, we, we have to differentiate uh, uh, the cars to give more choice to the consumers. That, that was the beginning of modern management. Uh, and I think that the revolution that we will, we will be facing is similar to the one we have seen 100 years ago with Sloan. Uh, so we, we, we are coming to, to something that is the virtualization of services or the servitization. So goods and services that uh, were performed in a certain way or were having certain characteristics will be completely transformed. Among the first early adopter of this has been the IT industry with the virtualization of, uh, of the data centers. I mean, the data center was an interesting business because it was uh, a real estate business and it, uh, it succeeded on inefficiencies. It succeeded uh, on, uh, on excess capacity, it succeeded on peaks, it succeeded uh, on disruption. So it was the inefficiency that uh, made the success of data centers, of the early data center approach. Now, with the virtualization of data center, with the development of uh, virtualization software, with the development of sophisticated storage capacity, we have uh, virtualized data centers. But, of course, that was not the only virtualization. We're going toward uh, virtualization of networks. Uh, We're going to virtualization of almost everything. In the, in the goods area, we have virtualized books, we have virtualized mu music, but that was a long time ago. Now we are virtualizing more sophisticated goods. Think, for instance, uh, at uh, Uber and uh, the virtualization of the cars. Uh, at some point, uh, the car is one of the most sophisticated objects that uh, you can have. It's, uh, it has been for several decades uh, uh, a a status symbol. You wanted the car because it was nice, fancy, uh, it was a sophisticated object, but you wanted to own a car. Then you started having problems, parking problems, uh, congestion problems, and then what you started to understand is that you didn't need to buy a car, but what you wanted were efficient transportation services. And here came Uber, uh, and, and the other virtualization of cars services that you find now and that are becoming dominant. I mean, they, are, they are not yet as, as spread as one could imagine, but it's simply because uh, uh, people are not yet uh, used to the benefits of this kind of virtualization. 
uh, Amazon, of course, was one of the first big company to make virtualization, uh, virtualization a a uh, the core of its uh, of its uh, business models, uh, and it made virtualization to a sophisticated stack of of uh, software development, enabling developers to use their APIs, exposing the APIs, uh, and this allowed another step in virtualization. Exposure of APIs is something really recent in the, in the telecommunications industry. It started a couple of years ago. People understood that empowering other people to make, uh, to use the uh, application protocol interfaces for different services, they could enable an, an enormous amount of services for the benefit of consumers. So, so we have uh, examples of virtualization also in very sophisticated uh, areas. Uh, think, for instance, of uh, Rolls-Royce that is selling not any longer uh, aviation engines, but it's serving aviation engine services by the hour. So that means that uh, uh, there will be an enormous amount of opportunities in the world of the Internet of Things. But there will also be enormous amount of challenges because the original architecture of the Internet uh, was based on a very different concept than the architecture that we need for the Internet of Things. The original architecture of the Internet was based on uh, a close community of trusted people, of people that knew each other, so reliability was not a real problem. Uh, all of you know that the key concept of, of the Internet uh, as we know it is best effort. But best effort uh, will not be enough for the Internet of Things. Uh, uh, and reliability will be critical. So, I mean, think of what would happen if telemedicine applications were based uh, on the best effort uh, concept. Or think uh, what would happen if power generation or, I mean, selling the uh, aircraft engine by the hour would ba be based on, on, uh, uh, on, the, on the concept of best effort. No, no, you need reliability, which is a completely different approach. And, and also, you need uh, other qualities that you didn't have in the, in the, I in the old internet. You need uh, a very strong uh, approach to safety and security. Think, for instance, what would happen if uh, a terrorist would take control of your car, of your uh, self-driving car, and, uh, and drive you to, to, uh, to crash into a, a mall? Or what would happen if a terrorist would take control of an engine or of a power station, leaving you without power? Uh, I think that uh, security and safety that uh, in the past has been developed on an ad hoc basis. I mean, the financial world needed security and developed ad hoc solution. But uh, it has to be embedded in the architecture of the new Internet of Things. There won't be any longer the possibility of uh, using, of, of having an Internet of Things that is not reliable, that is not secure, that is not safe. Uh, and then there is the problem of uh, privacy. The problem of privacy, I mean, people have given up privacy uh, in order to benefit uh, from the uh, advancement of social networks uh, and, uh, and the applications that are available on the social networks. But uh, privacy with the Internet of Things is a completely different concept. What if someone would get access to your medical data uh, and uh, his, it's not a physician or it's not uh, a hospital. I mean, you need to protect uh, your data. And then, finally, there is the problem of interoperability. Now, the problem of interoperability is, again, something that has differentiated uh, the Internet world from the old telecommunications world. The telecommunications world was based on the concept of interoperability. I mean, you can call from uh, Barcelona to Shanghai because all the telecommunication systems 
have been developed uh, on interoperable, on common standards, on standards defined by international treaties. You know that uh, internet and uh, the, the internet community did not want this approach. It might change now with what has happened in the, state rec in the states recently with the decision of the FCC to change the decision of 2002 that uh, completely took out uh, the, the internet from the telecommunication system. Now, probably there will be something, I mean, there will be a swing backwards in that direction. But uh, we will need interoperability because uh, the services will need to operate with the same standards uh, in every part of the world. So uh, I think that the business models that we will see in the Internet of Things will be quite different from the business models we have seen in the older Internet. In the older Internet, you remember back 10, 15 years ago, it was all, all a problem of clicks, of eyeballs. Uh, uh, nobody knew really how these clicks and eyeballs could translate into profits, cash flow, dividends, uh, but it was, uh, it was a big hype uh, and, uh, of course, it was a bit hype that created a lot of enthusiasm and created a lot of things. Now, the Internet of Things needs reliability, needs interoperability, needs security, ne needs privacy, and therefore, it will dictate the business uh, models. And there will be basically two main areas uh, that will define the business models. The areas that will be dominated by public sector requirements that will be regulated and that will be the domain of the big guys. The big guys are getting very heavily into the Internet of Things. Uh, you see initiatives by General Electric, by Siemens, uh, by, by everybody. All the big players consider the Internet of Things as something that they need to develop very aggressively. Uh, on the other hand, there will be, however, opportunities in the unregulated uh, sector, but these opportunities will require the ability to dominate the entire vertical uh, application system. So, again, it will need uh, fairly a fairly sophisticated approach. So, on the one side, big guys, on the, on the other side, sophisticated uh, sophisticated concept, sophisticated approach, and the ability to develop vertically integrated solutions. So, in a nutshell, to conclude, I think that the IoT world will probably offer more opportunities because it will be much, much bigger than the older Internet. The older Internet was dedicated mostly to, to a domain that was the domain of the telecommunications uh, industry. The Internet of Things will expand in every domain and we, will have, uh, uh, and we will have all the industries that will be reshaped by the Internet of Things. So the opportunities uh, will be either on a smaller scale because you will be developing on software developer kits that, uh, uh, that will be made available by the big players or will require more sophisticated management skills. So, just as a final conclusion, I think that unlike the first internet revolution that was dominated by few brave or many brave, uh, uh, many brave entrepreneurs that were rushing for the gold mines, now it will be dominated uh, by professionals that really know where they want to go. Thank you very much and have a good uh, and enjoy the 4YFN. The Thank you.